This is Pastor Mike Hogan coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are studying numbers again. Numbers in the King James Bible, numbers that help us understand that the Bible really is a more sure word of prophecy. Let me tell you where I get that from, and that's going to kind of bounce us into uh, what we're studying, especially this particular number. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is telling us his witness, his testimony, that he was there when he heard the voice of God above speak the words, this is my beloved son. And Peter said, I'm a witness of it. I was with others. We all heard it. We knew that it was God. God was bearing witness to us that this was his beloved son. And I just believe what I heard from God. And he's saying, you can believe what I said. However, there's something just in case you don't think that I actually heard God's voice or you're not sure that I heard it right. He said, you actually have something better than that. Second Peter chapter one, he said, verse 17, for he received from God, the father, honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. Now, Verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So Peter's saying here, the first witness is me telling you that we heard God's voice saying, this is my beloved son. Peter said, I believe it. You should believe it. But he said, there's something better than my witness. And he said, it is a more sure word of prophecy. Now he's not saying that the Bible is more sure than Peter's testimony, but it's not 100% sure. He's saying we have a more sure word of prophecy, meaning that this Bible is sure that we can believe exactly what this Bible says. We can put our trust in it. And he said, you do well that you believe that. So what we have here established in second Peter are two witnesses that Peter heard the voice, but Peter's a man. And we have the more sure word of prophecy. The second witness from Genesis to revelation telling us that Jesus is God's beloved son. And we do well that we take heed to this. And, he, and I like what he said here, because he's talking about prophecy. And he said, where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So what he's saying is that there is something, a day that we are looking forward to, the day when the day star, which is Jesus, is going to arise in our hearts, meaning that instead of us carrying a Bible around, we're going to have the Bible written in our hearts and we'll know it. We'll know every word of it. God himself is going to write it in the fleshy tables of the heart. So what he's saying here is that we can believe absolutely that every word of God is sure in this book, and it's going to stay that way until a day in the future, a day that hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. So where do we get the idea that we study numbers? We covered this last week, but I always like to go back and touch on this. And that gives us the Bible teaching that we study numbers. The first one, Revelation chapter 13, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, we have a second witness in the Bible because we're going to be dealing with this number as a prophecy number. We're going to understand from the Bible what it means and how it relates to events that are going to take place in Bible prophecy. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is the 666th 
chapter of the entire Bible, starting Genesis chapter 1, Solomon said, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And then verse 27, behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. So two witnesses, one Old Testament, one New Testament. They're both telling us that wisdom, understanding comes from counting numbers in the Bible, counting lists in the Bible, counting how God says things. Why does God often repeat himself? Like Jesus saying, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Why not just verily, I say unto thee? Why do you have to say it twice? Is it something poetic? Is it something that just Jesus liked to say? No, I think it means something. Verily, verily gives us two very sure witnesses. One Old Testament, that's verily, and the New Testament, which is verily, verily. So we count things in the Bible, and both of these verses are associated with the exact same number, 603 scored in six, and both tell us that wisdom and understanding, which are two of the seven spirits of God in Isaiah chapter 11, they both tell us that wisdom and understanding concerning doctrine, concerning Bible prophecy events, things that have happened, things that are going to happen, they're telling us that these things can come by counting numbers. I got, a, I got another one in my head. Ecclesiastes gives us this idea, and you'll see the number two here. Ecclesiastes chapter one, one generation passeth and another generation cometh. So you have two generations. One passing, one that's coming. Mom and dad, two people, give birth to a child. They pass on. This child continues on. But then that circuit repeats. Then he says in verse 5, the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down. Two things the sun does. Arises and it goes down. And then he says the wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. South and north. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return. So they come from the sea, and they return into the sea. Two things. So then he says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. Two things. One, a historical event given to us in the scriptures, is that which hath been, and the thing that shall be is a prophetic event. And the Bible, here's, to me, this just makes sense. The Bible has to be right concerning both of them. Because the fruition of everything that God's going to do is he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth are going to pass away, but the old heaven and the old earth and how he created them are a model for how he's going to create the new heaven and the new earth. So I believe what, I mean, exactly what the Bible says concerning the creation in the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth, two things. And we know that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So if we say that we believe what God said concerning the future, but we don't believe what God said in his word concerning the past, God said that how he's going to do it in the future is based on how he did it in the past. So if the Bible's not right concerning what it says about the creation of the first heaven and the first earth, how then can we trust the Bible in what it says concerning the second heaven and the second earth? And you have all these people who say they're Christians. They say they are going to spend eternity in heaven. You would assume then that they believe the new heaven and the new earth. And yet they don't believe that God created the universe in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago, according to the genealogies that we have in the Bible. They don't believe that. 
They don't believe that an evening in the morning were the first day, an evening in the morning were the second day. They don't believe that. They try to expand it. Oh, it's 13 billion years. So I don't have a whole lot of hope in thinking that I'm going to have to wait another 13 billion years for God to create the second heaven and the second earth. And according to what I know in the Bible, this first, the second heaven and the second earth is going to be far better than the first one. So would it take longer to make that second heaven and second earth? I don't think so. I just think God is going to do exactly what he said he has already done according to the testimony of the word of God. And that's how we believe and why we believe Bible prophecy. The way God did it the first time is the way God did it the second time. Two witnesses in the Bible of how God does things. So let's study, since we're in Genesis 1, let's go there and study the meaning of the number two. We've already sort of laid the foundation in it already, not even getting into my notes, just laying that foundation of what that number two represents. Genesis chapter 1 verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide, there it is, the waters from the water. So we have two sections of waters and they're divided. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. So we have waters, but now we have two sections of waters. God dividing them. We have water here on the earth and we have water in the atmosphere, the first heaven. And clearly we can see the expanse, what God says, the open firmament of heaven. It's wide open and it's huge. And there's water up there. And God divided that water here from that water down here. And that on the second day, he's giving you sort of the foundation of the meaning of that number two. It's the number four, things that are divided, things that are separated, segregated, um, first and then second. Let's keep reading and see what God says in Genesis chapter two, because I think that the, a greater understanding of each Bible number can be found in that Genesis chapter. Genesis one, we looked at that last week. That's primary thing. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And now the number two, we're going to look in Genesis chapter two for that understanding. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So we have one man, but he's alone. And God, God said about all the creation, God said that it was good. God said it was good. God said it was good. But then he looks at man and he says, Man's alone. That's not good. Right, man? It's not good that we're alone. God makes us someone that is meat for our life, someone who is sufficient, someone who helps us in our life, helps us think because they don't see things the same way that we do. It's probably because most of them are shorter than we are. But anyway. So in verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. Notice there's two flesh of my flesh. That's two. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we have two different creatures, two different names. Therefore shall a man leave his two things, father and his mother, and shall notice this word cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. The word cleave here means that God sticks them together and nothing. Remember what Jesus said, therefore what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And we know that this is a prophecy concerning, Paul said it in Ephesians 5, concerning Christ and his church. And no man, listen to me now, no man is able to separate Christ from his bride. Nobody. If you are part of the body of the bride of Jesus Christ, no man in the earth can pull you out of it or can say, you're not part of the church. Get out. 
No man can do that. Once you are the bride, you are the bride. And no man can put us asunder. Amen? So now we see the two, God took Adam, made two people out of him. Then he brings them together and they become one flesh. We're going to see Ephesians 5. We're going to see how important that is. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed. And I have written here Old Testament and New Testament. And think about it. Here is Adam and Eve, and they are now joined together, and they are inseparable. And out of those two, God made them one flesh. And here is Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. And that's how God established it. Can two walk together except they be a great? How many legs do you have? You have two. If you just have one, you have a problem walking. If you have none, you can't walk. But God gave you two legs, and they're both pointed in the same direction. And your brain knows how to kick one leg out and one leg back, and then do the same only opposite, and then do the same only opposite again. God knows how to tell our brain. Our brain knows how to make our legs walk to the same place. Husbands and wives, guys, we need to pick somebody that's not only going to help us, but they're not going to fight us in what we believe. And I, I'm just thankful. I am thankful to God for my wife, because when God began to move in me concerning the Bible and other issues, I didn't have to fight with my wife over it. God had already put her there. And I was just basically just catching up to her. She never did go for these other translations like I did. I bought her an NIV for Christmas. She didn't like it. She never read it. I was mad because it cost me 50 bucks. That was a lot of money back then, okay? So anyway, I never had to fight her on those important issues. Now, again, we don't see eye to eye on everything. We're supposed to disagree every now and then on little bitty things. But I've learned that sometimes my wife is right and it's my job to listen to her because God may be using her to help me. Think about, think about what the church does. Is the church always silent concerning us speaking to Christ, telling him what we want? I mean, the body is connected to the head through the spinal cord and through the nerves. 66 nerve connections coming out of the 33 bones in our spine. That's a picture of the Bible. And that's how the head communicates to the body. But the body uses those same nerves to communicate back to the brain and tell the brain what it is that we need. Sometimes our legs hurt. We need aspirin. Sometimes our bellies are empty. We need food. Sometimes our body is, is uh, depleted and we need water. We need, and all of those come from the head. It's a two-way communication. The church pleads to the head, Christ, and says, this is what the body needs. And the head, because he loves his body, always responds by giving us what we need and what is best. And I love that. That's how it's supposed to work. Then you have the Old and New Testament, the two witnesses. And they don't hate each other. They don't, this, some people say, oh, the Old Testament, that's for Israel, and that's not for us, and that's all contradictory to how we were saved by grace. They're not saved by works. No, they're not. Abraham was saved by grace. Noah was saved by grace. David was saved by grace. And see, all the Old Testament writers, they were saved by grace. So they say the same thing. The Old Testament is that which was, New Testament, that which shall be. Genesis starts with how God did it here at the creation. Revelation at the end of the book tells us how God is going to do it. And those two agree together. Deuteronomy 19:15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. First Corinthians 14. 
Verse 27, if any man speak, look at this, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by course. Course means in order, one, and then another, and then another, and let one interpret. Now, I love this because the Bible, written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three languages that we don't know, and we have one interpretation of the two or three witnesses of the unknown tongues that the Bible was written in. This, the two witnesses, Old and New Testament, and they both speak together as one voice. I have one mouth. I have two vocal cords that vibrate against each other to make the voice, but they speak the same thing. That sound coming out of my two vocal cords, going past my two sets of teeth, one here and one here, both of them are required to say things like S and K and you know, letters like that. We need our teeth, two rows speaking the same voice. There are two witnesses speaking the exact same thing. Revelation 11, that gives us this sort of a clue. Everybody wants to know who the two witnesses are in Revelation 11. Is it Enoch and Elijah? Because they were the two that didn't die, they're raptured. Could be. Some say that it was Moses and Elijah because those are the two that showed up with Jesus in Revelation or Matthew chapter 17. What do I think? I think they're going to be exactly like the Old and the New Testament because they're the two witnesses. Revelation 11, I will give power unto my two witnesses. Think about that in relation to the Old and New Testament. They shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days. The Bible is a sure word of prophecy, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So whatever or whoever these two witnesses are, they're going to do exactly what the Bible does out of two witnesses, Old and New Testament. And they're going to speak the same thing, and they're going to prophesy, they're going to preach to the world for 42 months exactly the way the Bible is doing now. So whoever they are, I believe that they're going to match perfectly this Bible that we already have. The two witnesses are already here. And I've been preaching here lately on Gideon, and it came to my mind that when Gideon laid his fleece out before the Lord, how many times did he do it? Let's look at this. Judges chapter 6, verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together, and he wringed the dew out of the fleece in a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. I want you to notice that these are opposite. Like when your legs walk. One of them's here, but one of them's back here, but they need to be. One is holding its position where it was while the other one is stepping forward to where it will be. And then they reverse and then they do it again. So Gideon lays the fleece out and the first day it's full of water, ground is dry. And then he says, God, because Gideon's wanting to know for sure that this is God. He's testing the spirit and he's going to understand because of the two witnesses. And now the second one's different than the first because the second one is now the fleece is dry and the entire ground is wet. And now Gideon knows that this is the voice of God because they are two witnesses, one old, one new, one comes first, one comes second. 
and they're both speaking the same thing, and they are God saving Israel. Now, the salvation of Israel, I think, is a very important Bible prophecy, and it is related to the number two, and we're going to see how here shortly. Job chapter 33, we have two places in the Bible that actually tell us how God, when He speaks, how He speaks. Because we have all these spirits out here, all these gods, all these devils, and they will speak things to people and people will believe them. But they could actually prove whether or not it was God Himself speaking or other gods speaking. Let's read it from the scriptures. Job chapter 33, verse 14, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Psalm, now he's going to say it again. Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly doing what? Dividing the word of truth. So, the Old Testament is God speaketh once. The New Testament is God speaketh twice. And Paul said, rightly dividing the word of truth, and it just so happens that the word of truth is already rightly divided. And remember, the number two represents division. That's what God did on day two of creation. And in the second chapter of the Bible, He divided the waters here from the waters here. The water represents the Word of God. Jesus washes the church, His bride, with the water by the Word of God. And the waters are divided. And you have the Old Testament speaketh once. The New Testament, this is God speaketh twice. And it is the rightly divided word of truth. Now take a look at this. Psalm 139, 16, David says, In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He says in Isaiah, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, no one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. And you've heard my teaching on DNA, but DNA, the way it is in us humans and a lot of other species on this earth is it is a double helix. Two single strands of RNA joining together to make a double-stranded DNA. And it matches perfectly with, number one, the Word of God. The two strands represent the Old and the New Testament. The two witnesses, because they both agree the two testaments, the two becoming one flesh, they also represent the sealed and unsealed books. In Jeremiah chapter 32, we have that story where Jeremiah goes and buys the property of his first cousin, and he redeems it, and he takes the deed to the land, and they're in books, they're written out in books. One of them is sealed, one of them remains open and puts them in an earthen vessel. Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning us. The sealed book, the 27th book of the Old Testament is the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, the Bible says, seal up these words, Daniel. The book of Daniel sealed. The 27th book of the New Testament is the book of Revelation. And the angel tells John, seal these words not up. In other words, these words are not sealed. So you have DNA joined together by hydrogen bonds representing a book that is sealed. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. There is a book in God's right hand sealed with seven seals, and those seven seals represent the seven spirits of God. And I could just go on and on and on about the beauty of DNA being the two witnesses, none shall want her mate because when it's rightly divided, if it's adenine over here, then it must be thymine over here. That's how they're paired back together because adenine always links with thymine, guanine always links with cytosine. They're always mated correctly. They always join together perfectly. They're always 
the two witnesses of the one Word of God. And it's the Word of life. It is the Word of creation. And it contains the very essence of what our new body, our second body, is going to be because that's our second birth. Jesus said, except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. And we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, uh, something else related to the number two, and I've been studying this for years, and the more I see it, the more I'm convinced of it. When you're looking in the Bible and you see the number two, maybe somebody having like two sons or two wives or two of this or two of that, I want you to think of the number two pointing to the time of the Gentile bride. Let me give you a picture of that. In Genesis chapter 41, we have Joseph, who is a picture of Jesus. Remember, Joseph uh, is in prison. Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth, the prison. What's he doing down there? He's preaching. Who's he preaching to? He's preaching to two groups of people. Those who are in Abraham's bosom because he's going to set captivity free. And then those who are, must remain there until the last judgment when God is going to bring them up out of hell, judge them, cast them into the lake of fire. So remember, Joseph is in prison, and he's prophesying to two men. One's the baker, and one's the butler. To the butler, he prophesies, after two days, there's that number, you're going to be lifted out, and you're going to be set again as the butler to Pharaoh, and you're going to squeeze the wine out of the cluster into his cup, okay? The new wine, the Holy Spirit. But then to the baker, who has all these baked meats on his head, he's going to be lifted up, but he's going to be judged, and he's going to be hung cursed is, from a tree. Cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. So the baker represents those who died in unbelief and are awaiting that last final judgment. So here's Joseph now. He's a type of Christ, and he's going to be the savior of his brethren. But before he is, he's given a Gentile bride. Genesis 41, 50, and Joseph, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. So he's given the, the priest of On, he's given her daughter, Azanath, and he has two sons. Who does he have? Manasseh and Ephraim. And remember what he does? He's going to give... Uh, who is it? Manasseh, who's the firstborn. He's going to give him, he brings him before his father Jacob to be blessed. And Manasseh is supposed to receive the right hand blessing because he's the firstborn. But remember what uh, Jacob did. Crossed his hands. Gave Ephraim the right hand blessing. Manasseh the second hand blessing. Meaning Manasseh's blessing comes after Ephraim. That which is last shall be first, and that which is first shall be last in the kingdom of God. And you have the two there, Israel and the Gentiles. The Gentile bride having two sons represents a time prophecy, represents the double portion, it represents the new covenant given to Israel. Um, let's look at it like this. Job chapter 42. The Lord turned the captivity of Job, and when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job, I believe, represents Israel. He loses everything, and yet when God gives it back, he gives it back to him double than what he had before. Job receives a double blessing. Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye. Stop right here. Again, why does God say this twice? Why is he saying, verily, verily? Why does he say, comfort ye, comfort ye? Why does he say, Babylon is fallen, is fallen? Why did Dagon fall twice? All of these, I think, represent a time prophecy by which God is going to judge the wicked of the world, but he's going to save Israel in the last days. So he says to Israel, comfort ye, 
comfort ye. Now, two things here. Number one, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. You know how many times the word comfort is in the Bible? No, it's not two. 66. That we, through patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. So think about this. God says to Israel, comfort ye. That is the Spirit coming to them the first time. That is all the words of the Old Testament. Comfort ye, comfort ye. Now he's adding to it and adding the words of the New Testament. And what is God going to do when he says, comfort ye, comfort ye to Israel? Look at it. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. Two things. Her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Think about it. Israel receives, number one, the Old Testament, comfort ye, then the double portion, which is comfort ye, comfort ye. The New Testament being granted to Israel, even though she has sinned all these sins, even though the Jews historically have been very evil people, probably at the heart of a lot of conspiracies in this world, are Jewish people. Do they hate God? Oh, absolutely. Do they hate Jesus, their Messiah? There's no doubt they crucified him. And yet, God loves them. And why is God going to pardon their sins? Because they finally did good? No. He's going to do it because he loves them. And he's not going to break his promise to them. And for all of her sins, God is going to give her the double blessing, the double portion. Second Kings chapter 2. And it can't, think of Elijah, who is raptured. He represents the Gentiles, translated into heaven. We're the bride. Who does that leave? Elisha. And what does Elisha want from Elijah? Came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Two things. And did what? Parted them, divided them, both asunder. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. You see that? Elijah represents the Gentiles, the bride, translated into heaven, and remember what Elisha wanted. He wanted a double portion. And Elijah said, it's kind of a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I leave, then it shall be done. Now think about it. Has the people of Israel, the Jews, the tribes of Jacob, have they ever received that double blessing, that double portion? No. You know why? Elijah hasn't left yet. We're Elijah. So what, what's going to happen when the generation of the Jewish people see us taken into glory? They are going to be the ones who receive the double portion. The number two. Isaiah 61, 7. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Zechariah 9, 12. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. This is God making these promises to Israel that he's going to give them the double portion. The second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? Well, we know in the book of Acts, Peter preaches that you know, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He said, this is that which Joel prophesied, right? 
And we know that God speaketh once, yea, twice. So, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we have Peter preaching that, and he gives, he's quoting from Joel, chapter 2, and he says, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, that's two, shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, visions and dreams, that's two, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, that's two, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, this is what God said was going to happen when God did all of this. He said, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, that's two, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. That's two, the sun and the moon. Before that great notable day of the Lord come. It's the great and notable day. You see it? You never saw these twos in here before, right? There they are. I pro what I'm trying to do is next time you read the Bible and you see one and then another one, you'll never miss it again. And you'll go, that represents either the last judgment Second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Think about it. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now he's quoting Joel chapter 2, and he actually cuts it off halfway through the verse. Go back and read that passage in Joel 2, and you'll see that Peter stops preaching halfway through a sentence. Okay? So, did any of this happen? Did the sun turn dark and the moon turn to blood when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost? Were the stars darkened? Did they fall from heaven? No. Were there blood and fire and vapors of smoke? No. Does that mean that there are only metaphors that, well, God said it, but he didn't really mean exactly that. He meant something else. No. God's not a man that he should lie, and God doesn't exaggerate, and God doesn't just tell stories that never happen. God, what God says happens. So what do I believe is going to happen? I believe that there is a fulfillment, a perfect future fulfillment of everything that God said. God speaketh once. May have been part, the things that surrounded Jesus and his crucifixion, resurrection, partially fulfilled, but not fully fulfilled. Things yet that God said are going to happen, they're going to happen. And when it's fulfilled double, Israel then receives the double portion. Jeremiah 31, 31. I like this. Because this is where, 31, 31, God promises a second covenant to Israel. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See the two? He's going to... And Ezekiel 37, he has two sticks and he brings them together. And he said, that's Israel, the 10 tribes, and Judah. I'm going to make them one nation again. The two become one. Make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, meaning Mount Sinai, which covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. See what he does? He does two things. He writes it in there. He puts it in their inward parts, writes it in their hearts. And then he says, and will be their God. They shall be my people. Two things again. I will be their God. They should be my people. Two things. When Paul talked about this in the book of Hebrews, here's what he said. Hebrews 8, 13. In that he saith a new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. I mean, think about it. We're born twice. My first body is under the old covenant. The old covenant is decaying and waxing old, and it's ready to vanish away, along with my body, which is decaying and wax. I'm in the waxing, I'm in the waxing old stage. I'm not in the waxing new stage. I'm, I'm, in, I'm not in the wax on, I'm in the wax off. All right? I'm over the hill now. And my body doesn't respond the way it used to respond. And now 
I'm afraid of falling and I'm holding on to handrails when I go downstairs and now my body hurts. It didn't used to hurt this bad. Now it does. And I'm losing my hair and what hair I got is getting gray and I'm losing my mind. And But the inner man is renewed every day. So what's going to happen to Israel? God's going to give them. He's already given the first covenant. That failed. He's going to give them the new covenant. I love this. Hosea chapter 6. Look at this. After how many days? Two days. Stop right here. Christ comes the first time. Then Christ comes the second time. When? After two days. Peter said, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Do we have another witness? Yes. In the book of Psalms it says, a thousand years in thy, in thy sight are as but yesterday. Two witnesses that say a day is a thousand years. And a thousand years is a day. So two days from Christ to the second coming. How many days did Abraham journey with Isaac to offer him on Mount Moriah? Two days. It's a picture. And, and Abraham came, oh, let's say 2,000 years before Christ. Two days. God fulfilled it exactly. God's going to fulfill this. This is why I say the number two, I think, represents the Gentile age. It's two days. 1,000 years, 2,000 years. And so we're kind of in that getting to the end of the second day. We're about ready to step into the third day. And then that third day is the millennial reign. It's also the seventh day of God's creation. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Matthew 26, 2, you know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. John eleven six. 6, when he had heard them, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Why did Jesus do that? So he could resurrect him on the third day. How many words did he speak? Lazarus, come forth. And I love this. Okay. So the two days are the 2,000 years that precede the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Israel and the timing of our being caught up into heaven like Elijah being caught up into heaven by that whirlwind. Joshua chapter 3. I read this one day and I just, man, I wept and I said, God, that is, that's perfect. That's it right there. Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. Remember, Moses couldn't. It takes two people to get them into the promised land. One to lead them out of Egypt, that was Moses, and then Joshua to lead them into the promised land. First covenant won't do it. Second covenant will. See, the Old Testament tells us we need to get out of Egypt, okay? Because that's our flesh, and we sinned, we broke God's laws. But the old covenant cannot get us into the promised land. Only the new covenant can. So Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. He's going to have them cross the river because remember there's a body of water that is separating in the firmaments. So they're going to cross a body of water to get into the promised land. So the Jordan River is going to act as that last firmament of waters that we have to cross to get into. But he says this. He said, I'm going to send the Ark of the Covenant in first, but I don't want you to be right on the tail of the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to have to wait. I'm going to send the Ark of the Covenant in, and then there is a space between when the Ark of the Covenant goes in and when you come in. Guess how many cubits they were to wait? Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. Yet there should be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. Think about it. None of us have ever been to heaven. 
We don't know the way. We must follow the one who knows the way. And he is Joshua, Jesus. He goes in. Think of Jesus. Where is he? When he died, where did he go? Into the promised land. Israel is going to have to wait 2,000 cubits before they can cross the river. Do you see that? I mean, I know it doesn't say, you're going to have to wait 2,000 years. But I think the 2,000 cubits are a perfect foreshadowing of the 2,000 years of the Gentile age. Then Israel gets to go into the promised land. I love this. Now we're going to look at one more thing, because remember, the two are Adam and Eve, Christ and his church, and they cleave together. And man cannot divide them. Man cannot pull them asunder, right? So that's Christ's kingdom. Now we're going to look at the devil's kingdom. Does, does the devil and all the people in the earth, are, they, are all the conspirators who are planning this new world order, are they all working together on the same plan, the same, have the same zeal, and they're all working on the same team, and they're all going to put their efforts together and take over the world, right? Because, I mean, I, I wondered, I mean, who's like really in charge of this thing? Is it the Vatican? Is it the Bilderbergers? So the Freemasons, because you know, the Vatican, at least on the outside, they're kind of at war with the Freemasons, right? Unless until you get in the top, then they're like Vatican Freemasons. And you have all these conspirators trying to bring in the Illuminati, trying to bring in this new world order. And I wanted to know who was like the top dog here. Who's like the one in charge? Well, I think they're all competing with each other. You know, there's this phrase, there's no honor among thieves. And I think the Bible's going to tell us that ultimately they don't stick together very good. And that is going to be their downfall. Genesis chapter 6. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Notice their opposites. But the sons of God, they're the men. Daughters of men, those are the girls. They were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. That, I think, is a foreshadowing. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, is DNA. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Do you see that? When Adam and Eve are joined together, they cleave together and man cannot put them asunder. And Jesus and his bride, they too become one flesh. They cleave together and no man can put them asunder. So the devil, he's going to try. He's got all these gods, all these devils, all these angels going to be kicked out of heaven. They're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. They're going to get married to mankind. And you know, if you ever looked at two people and they get married and, and you say, oh, congratulations, you're married. But back in the back of your mind, you're going, oh, that's destined for divorce. There's no way in the world those two people are going to stick together very long, right? And then usually you find out, well, they were right. That's the devil's kingdom. Lamentations 4.16, the anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. Daniel chapter 5, verse 28, Perez, Thy kingdom is divided and given to who? Medes and Persians. That's two. Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So, they're trying to get together, make a new world order. It's going to be all the gods, all the evil angels, all the devils, and mankind are all going to form a pact and join it, united forces, and try to defeat Jesus 
and his mighty army. And the Bible says, basically, they're just going to defeat themselves. Their kingdom is divided against themselves, and they shall not. It's going to be brought to desolation. So you actually have a picture of this. Revelation 17, notice this. In verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So you have the woman. I think she represents, she's Mystery Babylon the Great. I think she represents the harlot nature of mankind. Then you have the beast, okay, which is a spirit of the, the gods, right? The devil. He's a devil. So she's riding him, right? Looks like everything's going well. They're, they're joined together. But then you look in verse 16, the ten horns, which are on the beast, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That kingdom is divided. I mean, here's the whore riding the beast. The beast has to do what she tells him to do, right? Well, those ten horns on the beast, they're going, uh, we hate her. We despise her. So they turn on her and eat her, burn her, burn her up, devour her. She's gone. That kingdom is bound for divorce. They're divided against themselves, and that kingdom shall not stand. Isn't it beautiful? So now when you are studying the Bible, and you see, two th think of the two sons that um, Rebecca had, Esau and Jacob. Were they identical twins? Oh, no. They, and they were as different as night and day. Esau was like a hairy beast. And he was called Esau because he came out red and covered with hair, like fur, right? And he's like the gruff. I'm going to kill, I can't wait for deer season. I'm going to kill me some deer. Get me a big old buck, right? I mean, he's that kind of guy. And you have Jacob. And he's kind of like, you know, uh, Mom, what do you want me to cook today? I mean, he's like Mama's boy, right? But God picked Jacob over Esau. And God even said they represent two nations or two types of people. And they're divided against each other. God chose one and he rejected the other. So as you're studying the Bible, you see this number two, whether it's in two things that are mentioned together, two sons, two wives, uh, I don't know, the sun and the moon, the greater light rules over the day, lesser light rules over the night. You're going to see two all in the Bible. And as you study these things, think of the nation of Israel, how God's going to save them. Think of the time prophecies. Think of things that are divided and never to be brought together or things that are joined together and no man can put them asunder. And then God is giving you wisdom to help you see what is going to happen in the future. How soon is it going to be? Two minutes, two hours, two days, two weeks, two months, two years, two decades? I don't know. That God's going to do it in His time. He's going to follow the plan that He's laid out in His sure word of prophecy. I enjoy talking about these numbers probably as much or more as I do talking about anything because they just make the Bible make sense. And that's what I hope to give you. A little bit of wisdom, a little bit of knowledge so that God will bless you with understanding. All right? It's Pastor Mike. We'll do some more later on. Number three is coming up next. All right? We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.